want to talk a little bit about capital structure. And you said a statement to me that literally the moment you finish saying it, it's just been echoing in my mind ever since. And it's a really simple, short statement, but I think it's really profound. And it's just that venture back tech is under levered. Can you talk a little bit about kind of capital structure and how to think about private leverage versus public leverage and that opportunity? I think you have to start with the prototypical venture backed company today and ask yourself, what does a capital structure look like? It's SaaS. B2B SaaS is the prototypical venture backed business. And it's almost all equity. Sometimes they'll raise some venture debt from SVB or something like that. But for the most part, it's all equity. But you can look at LBO SaaS businesses that have been bought by private equity firms or being acquired or, or whatever, and they hold a lot of debt. And I'm not necessarily saying that levering up in that way is the right thing to do. That's not what I'm trying to say here at all. What I'm trying to say is that even a business that doesn't generate profits has assets that are highly leverageable. And at the most basic level, it's their customers. And those customers produce contracts, but it's really the customers that is the atomic unit. And then you build out from there. And so if you have customers, you get contracts. If you get contracts, you have receivables. If you have receivables, then you have cash flow that you can leverage. And so, you know, there's a question of, well, what are the true unit economics of a business? And that really is like the whole foundation, in my opinion, of how you think about businesses today and growth businesses. And how do you see something that maybe on the P&L today doesn't generate profits, but has tremendous future earnings potential? It's what is the atomic unit in terms of unit economics, customer level unit economics. And if the company produces enough of those, where is it in the future? But to digress on that point and talk about capital structure, I think that there are a couple of factors that drive these businesses being under levered. A lot of it has to do with investor psychology, which is there is a statistical truth about what will occur with an investment, whether it's equity or debt or anything else. And then there's the perception of what is likely to occur. And oftentimes those things can diverge when the world is moving quickly or where things have changed from what would have been expected in the past. And so I think that is an example of venture-backed businesses where there's an expectation that a lot will fail. There's still fear about the prior tech bubble in the early 2000s. And there's also just, in some cases, a lack of understanding around what unit economics really mean for a business. There is just not as much interest in lending to venture-backed businesses in ways other than one where someone will come in and say, okay, you just raised $10 million of equity, I'll give you $3 million of debt. And the reality is that these businesses do stand on their own. And I'd like to make the point that it's probably the case that a higher percentage of venture-backed businesses will have some positive outcome than if you were to take 20 years of data and identify you know how many of them were zeros i think it's different now i think it's different now because it takes a lot less money to start a business and you can generate profits or at least positive cash flow way earlier on in the life cycle of the business and so when you have cash flow even if you don't have profits you have a lot more optionality around what you do where you take the business and how you spend those cash flows to either grow or if you realize that you're not creating value, you can do other things. Whereas if you're not generating any cash flow or any revenue or any gross profits, you're entirely dependent on your investors to decide your fate. And I think, especially in the past, the venture market didn't look the way that it does today, where every fund raises another fund before they're even done investing the last one. And there's a huge incentive to just deploy dollars. Because a 2% management fee, and now in some cases, even more than that, is a great way to make a lot of money if you can raise enough capital. I think there are a lot of factors at play. I think that it will change. I think it's going to change not because of enterprise SaaS businesses really wanting debt, although there are some, Alex Danko wrote a piece about that recently. There's also some interesting venture-backed businesses going after lending to SaaS businesses. But I actually think it's going to be 
the other businesses that require more creative capital structures. And that's kind of along the lines of Benedict Evans put out a piece a couple of years ago called The End of the Beginning, basically saying that we've done a lot of the things that are software only. And that isn't to say that there won't be a lot more great software businesses, but there is a huge untapped world out there that exists in the physical world that needs software. And it needs a hybrid of venture software and then some either physical, financial, or other form of capital to scale up. And so those businesses are going to require things other than just pure equity. And there's going to be a lot of amazing companies that we see over the next 10, 20, 30 years that have that model. And they're all going to need some other form of capital. And so figuring out how to do that and how to structure it in the right way is something that I'm really interested in. And it brings me to say, we've already been this and we're continuing to invest our internal capital into being a life cycle investor, meaning that we come in early at the seed stage, sometimes, depending on what the business is, invest in the debt, also provide equity, and then stick around with the business as it grows. So that doesn't mean we're leading every round by any means, but it means we're participating and it means we're figuring out as the business scales, what the best capital structure looks like. And then we have the tools to actually implement it because we have the credit fund and we have our equity funds. And I think that's unique. My view is that there's going to be lots of incredible businesses in our lifetimes that need a solution like that. And the thing is, it's hard to replicate. I'll tell you it's hard to replicate because I've done it. It's really hard to do these credit deals, especially because they're highly structured. You spend three months doing it. The legal fees are $100,000 or more sometimes, depending on the size of the deal. And there's a more limited universe of LPs that want to invest in it. A lot of people understand the venture model now, less so what I just described. Now, I'm surprised by the types of investors that we're talking to now that want to do these kind of deals and participate. So I'm encouraged by that. But I think it's a pretty open space. And I've heard some really well-known VCs flirt with this idea, but none of them have done it yet. I think I know why. If I was in their position, I don't think I would do it. I didn't have that luxury. I'm kidding. I think it's really interesting. And I really like being able to participate on both sides and wear a different hat depending on what deal we're looking at. And that was why I was so excited to have you on and why I've been fascinated by what you're doing at Stratos, because I think that you are pioneers in a space that I think if we were to jump forward five, 10 years in the future, I think every founder, every entrepreneur is not just going to think, let me go out and raise equity you know, from the typical venture capital investors. They're going to say, okay, to grow this business or to achieve these milestones, I'm going to need capital. Here's a few different options. And they're going to be able to think about that in a more nuanced way. And they're going to be able to partner with someone like Stratos throughout the life cycle of a company. And I think that's for me was kind of the aha moment is I know plenty of entrepreneurs that have raised one round, multiple rounds. I mean, you would think from the outside looking in, okay, you've raised a seed round. Cool. You just like rinse and repeat and you're going to go raise your A. No, it is. You're literally starting back from square one. You're talking to different investors. You've got a different pitch. These people aren't likely, haven't been following along. And so someone like Stratos to be able as an entrepreneur to partner throughout the life cycle of a business, just seems really fascinating and really different. 